hey guys, I've got a really cool guest here. Uh, he's been on the show before. Uh, he recently passed a massive milestone of 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, it is David Dole, the host of The Rational National. How's it going, David? Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm doing well. Um, so what we have right now is obviously the 2020 primary is coming up and everyone's announcing their candidacies except for Bernie, apparently. Um, yeah. So what I thought we would do is uh, we should just kind of run through the candidates that we know of right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought we'd start with Tulsi Gabbard, and then I'll kind of like bring up some other names and we'll go through them. Sure. So, so, go so ahead. Tulsi what Gabbard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Tulsi Gabbard is somebody who me, uh, uh, like a lot of people, I was very impressed with her a few years ago when she came out and uh, left the DNC so she could support Bernie. And she discussed how she felt this internal pressure within the DNC, the Democratic Party, to uh, fall in line and support Hillary Clinton. I thought it took a lot of courage of her to come out and talk about that uh, because we all know the, the Clinton machine was, was huge back then. And to not feel uh, or to, to not bow to that pressure, I think, showed incredible strength. But there's some weird stuff now. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, I mean, the her history on, on gay rights, and look, I understand she was born into a family, her father was very anti-gay, uh, I get that, it's still, it just doesn't look good, um, she has, uh, there's been discussions of her ties to, to, uh, Modi in, in India, which, look, I'm not huge into international issues, so I don't know too much about that, but reading from people that do understand that very closely, it's not a good thing. So again, we're talking about some, some weirdness there. But also, she's also been mixed on, on Israel-Palestine, which I feel like doesn't get mentioned enough. So that, I think, is incredibly questionable. Um, that said, she's great on, on domestic policy. She's very progressive on domestic policy. But she, it's weird. I want to hear her talk about that more. So it feels like whenever I hear Tulsi Gabbard talk, she's talking a lot about foreign policy. And foreign policy is important it's important to talk about how you know regime change is bad and all that but i want to hear more i want to hear your economic message i want i, I feel like like a, a domestic message should still be the in the forefront and take precedent over any foreign policy issues um and i just haven't seen her be as engaged in that i also think her rollout for 2020 was kind of weird she <laughs> might be the only person to to announce it on Van Jones show. It, it I, I also, I mean, hearing about the the uh, the fallout from that too, it sounded like her campaign wasn't ready for that. Like she was just in that moment, she decided, okay, right now I'm going to announce that I'm going to run, and nobody on her team was ready. Like I, I think her her campaign manager dropped. Don't quote me on that, but somebody important in her campaign left like a week after she announced. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so there, there's some weirdness uh, around that. Look, but that said, if we're going to rank the candidates, I think Tulsi Gabbard is near the top. Um, but it's, I mean, we're going to go through all these candidates here, but it's like, we're all just playing games. Uh, it's Bernie Sanders is like, <laughs> like who else? <laughs> like well, we here, here's what I'm curious about. What yeah, I'm very ahead. curious about and what I find to be peculiar about the situation is, like, I'm like 99% sure Bernie's going to announce. What is Tulsi going to do if Bernie announces a run? Is she going to stay in? Is she going to drop out? Um, I mean, considering well, what she did last year, I'd be surprised if she stayed in, right? Yeah, it's a good question. But yeah, I guess, you know, if you consider that she dropped out or that she didn't, not that she dropped out, that she um uh, left the DNC to support Bernie, I guess you could say it would be weird for her to stay in, to to go against him in, in 2020. I think ultimately... I don't think Tulsi Gabbard is going to stay in that long. I think she may stay in long enough to try and uh, maybe raise her own profile, maybe try and change the conversation a bit in terms of uh, how she's against regime change, though she still seems to be in favor of, of uh, military funding. And, and like she's right. She's kind so of, have you have you read that quote from I believe it was the Intercept interview where she said that she's uh, she said she's, I believe, a hawk on ter wars against terrorists but a dove again uh, on wars um that are useless wars that don't work so i don't really understand yeah, where the line comes in there i, I think she, she was yeah so it, 
it's something like she's a she's a dove when it comes to regime change, but she's tough on terrorism, which is or yes, yeah, she's a hawk on terrorists, but she's a dove on regime change, something like that. But um, so, so like where does she draw the, the line in terms of war? Yeah, I mean she. It's just, I mean, I, I still think she, it sounds like she still supports droning, and we all know, you know, drone strikes leads to uh, civilian deaths, and and ultimately she doesn't seem as anti-war as people will try and make her out to be. She's anti-regime change, but mm -hmm. in terms of anti-war, it's a little more questionable. But uh, look again, I think she needs to be stronger. If she really wants to be serious about this, she needs a serious rollout. She needs a serious campaign, and she's. Uh, for whatever reason, she's not being taken seriously so far, and not just by the media. Of course, the media is going to smear her. And look, there are there are also let's be serious here. There are also very uh, bad faith critiques of her. Oh, there are people lot. that are going after her that just want to go after her. Sorry, uh, I said a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So we have to be able to to parse all that out. Understand that people that are critiquing Tulsi Gabbard are not necessarily coming from a, ba a bad place. There is our good faith critiques and bad faith critiques and be able to separate the two things. I just want her to be better. I want her to be more clear on issues like Israel-Palestine. I want her to talk about how maybe she was wrong about that in the past, why she changed. So that sort of thing. Where I want to understand her evolution in, in, all, these, uh, in all these different um, topics. But yeah, uh, it, it's hard for me to take anybody else seriously when... It's Bernie, and if Bernie doesn't run, it's Warren. So it's everybody so else. So you have Warren over Tulsi, because that's oh, a yeah. very potent conversation right now. Yeah. No, so I, tell I, us why you support Warren over Tulsi, because some people will disagree. Uh, Warren is better in terms of economic policy. I, I feel like Warren is a lot more educated and more. Um, she has shown a, a history to actually push back against powerful interests like Wall Street. So. Having uh, having a, an example of, of Elizabeth Warren or having her out there and already having this strong past. And look, before 2016, everybody wanted Warren to run against Hillary. I mean, Bernie eventually did run because Warren didn't. But Warren could have run in 2016, and I think she could have won. So we need to sort of get back to that mindset. People, I think, are... are uh, critiquing Warren too much over the fact that she didn't endorsed Bernie in, in 2016. And I think it was a mistake of her not to do that, but I totally understand why she didn't. She didn't because she was stuck in this strategic mindset where it's like, okay, like in her mind, she thought there's no way Bernie's going to win because that was the, the, the consensus around Washington. There's no way Bernie's going to win. Of course, it's going to be Hillary. So in her mind, she's thinking, well, Warren's thinking, if I endorse Bernie, then I completely lose Hil my ability to influence Hillary when Hillary wins. But, I mean, Hillary didn't win, <laughs> so that's the problem. But nobody knew that at the time. It, in terms of, it, you have to think of, just in terms of Warren's mindset at that time. In her mind, she's thinking, my best chance to push progressive policy forward is if I stay on Hillary Clinton's good side, so that when she wins... She will listen to me. George, she has a better chance at listening to me than if I had endorsed Bernie in the primary. So I believe that was Warren's thinking. So understanding that, I think, allows people to to maybe forgive Warren for, for not coming out and supporting Bernie in, in 2016. And understanding that this is somebody who is ultimately, on most issues, going to be on your side. Now, Warren, I can critique on her uh, inability to really be strong on Medicare for all. So she's now wavering on Medicare for all saying, oh, there's there's different way, uh, different ways to get there. Uh, no, Medicare for all. I mean, let's <laughs> let's not be the, we can't we have to push these people. Right. Like it's, it's not just about uh, you have to. It's not just about policy. It's also about strategy. So even if look, I hate playing this game, but let's say there's a compromise in the future. You don't want to come to the table with the compromise. You want to come to the table with the absolute position you definitely want to have. And then maybe if you win, see what happens. Maybe uh, start Medicare for all off with uh, you, you lower the age or you bring in younger people first. And then maybe the next year you bring in uh, the next age group. So there's different, uh, different ways that you can roll it out. But start from the absolute farthest position you possibly can hit. And then potentially, maybe, if you have to, just to be able to get there, you are forced to compromise in some way. 
but you do not compromise in the campaign. Now, that's one thing you absolutely don't do, and Warren is already doing that on Medicare for All. Right. I agree with that 100%. So uh, how do you feel about Warren's chances going forward? Um, Especially if little, Bernie is to announce. Yeah. I'm a little mixed on it. Uh, I feel like other people's... Everyone else's optimism that I'm seeing for Warren, you know, apart from some of the Twitter beefs and stuff, but the, the people that, that are optimistic about Warren are making me be a little more optimistic about her, but she hasn't really got the traction that I think she will need it to win so far. Now I know, look, it's super early. Voting is a year away. But in terms of the way the media has been focused so far, they're very focused on Kamala Harris. And it's uh, because there's going to be so many different candidates, it's going to be a lot harder for Warren to be able to get her voice in there when you have the media so focused on Kamala Harris. You have... Uh, the progressive voice is so focused on Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Warren is, she's up against a wall where she has to be able to get the support from the progressives or the mainstream press, and neither of them have her as their first choice. So Warren seems like a second choice for progressives and maybe like a fourth choice for, for, the, for the, the, the establishment types. But um, look, if Bernie doesn't run... I think Warren has a much better chance because then she'll get the progressive vote behind her. But if uh, Bernie does run and Warren is running, I don't think Warren makes it past like the first two states. Oh, oh, so you think she'll drop out in the first two states? She won't even make it past that? I just think Bernie's going to get the vote. I mean, if Bernie's running against her, it, it, unless they're, unless the country's a lot more progressive <laughs> and there's a <laughs> lot, or more diverse in their progressiveness and. There's, you know, a big group for Bernie, but also a big group for Warren. I just don't see that. That could potentially happen. But because of the way it a lot of it will depend on how how powerful the media still is. So if MSNBC and CNN and The New York Times and The Washington Post, if they are as powerful as they were in 2016, then they're going to be able to push someone like Kamala Harris out there that's going to be able to attract a lot of the attention away from people who may have voted for Warren. But if they don't have that uh, traction that the media had in 2016, and let's say, I don't know, maybe the Young, the, the young Turks or other progressive shows online are now uh, ha have more of an influence on the election, then there's the potential there for maybe multiple progressive candidates to, to, to make it far. But the way it's playing out, or the way at least it played out in 2016 and could still play out in 2020, is you're going to have the progressive candidate get Bernie, get most of the progressive vote. Uh, Warren may get some people who are maybe a, a little skittish about Bernie for whatever reason. Um, and then you'll have people vote for Kamala Harris. And I think, I mean, Kristen Gillibrand's going to be gone. Cory Booker's going to be gone. It, the top three, or the, the top two, the top two, if there was going to be a top two, um, it would be Bernie and Kamala at the end. So far, I think that's what would happen. But... We're going to have to see how it plays out. I mean, there's so much so much could happen between uh, now and Iowa, so it's hard to really guess. And what what were your thoughts on... Now, I know Richard Ojeda has dropped out now, but what were your thoughts on his campaign before he dropped out? Uh, at the beginning, I thought this guy's going to make it far because he is somebody who's a, he's a fresh face. He's bold. He's angry. He... Uh, has the ability to get the attention of conservative voters, even though I don't necessarily think they would vote for or uh, be registered to vote for a Democrat in a primary, but he would at least get the attention of, say, you know, a Fox News viewer um, simply through his forcefulness and his ability to actually uh, critique Trump on the things that he promised for people in, say, like West Virginia, where, where Ojeda's from. But um, then it started to come out, uh, Ojeda had some some weird positions on on Kavanaugh, which was really disappointing to see. I guess, I don't know. <laughs> that was just like, like one of the easiest positions to have was to be against Brett Kavanaugh. And he, did, he just wasn't there. So that would have definitely hurt him. The fact that he voted for Trump would have hurt him. Yeah. So uh, at the same time, though, Ojeda has to run for governor or senator in West Virginia. He He's a voice that I think the Democratic Party needs. He's not as progressive, especially on the, say, social issues that maybe we want him to be. But 
he has that anchor and he has that support for unions that I think the Democratic Party definitely needs. Didn't he uh, give up his state Senate seat to run for president and now it's filled by a more conservative person? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure who filled it, but yeah, he, he gave up his seat to run and then 10 days later he dropped out of the race. <laughs> so it probably just... wasn't a good move unless he has no, a plan. But, uh, Maybe he has unless a plan. He has a... Yeah, so <laughs> I did a video on, on Ojeda dropping out and um, – uh, I said that he should go after Capito. So Capito is the other uh, senator in West Virginia. There's Joe Manchin, the Democrat, then the Republican, uh, Capito. Uh, I think he should go after her in 2020. So she's up in 2020. He could run against her as a Democrat, assuming he wins the Democratic primary uh, for that race, and be able to, I think, potentially defeat her in 2020. So I think he should go after her, or if not her, then the governor, which is also potential. But I don't know. Um, okay, so those are kind of all the progressives, I believe. Um, now, out of the yeah. uh, the corporatists, you know, you have what are your thoughts on Kamala Harris? Um, she is very skilled. <laughs> she is uh, she is a lot more human than Hillary Clinton is. I don't want people to underestimate her. That's why I think she's going to make it far. She is able to inject this more, uh, she's more natural, more human than most politicians are. She has a lot of the same verbiage, the same uh, wording on policies like Medicare for all. But then, as we saw when she was pushed on it the next day after she said, oh yeah, sure, get rid of the private insurance companies. When she was pushed on it, her campaign was like, oh, actually, <laughs> there's multiple positions, multiple ways to get there. So she already is giving into corporate pressure before anything even starts. So it's... Kamala Harris is better than Hillary Clinton, probably, uh, definitely better than Hillary Clinton. But her past issues as a pro her past positions as a prosecutor, um, supporting the 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 death penalty. I mean, I did a whole video. I can't even recall everything I, I I discussed now, but I did a whole video breaking down a lot of her past, and it's it's not good. Um, when she talked about locking up parents whose kids are truant, and she was like laughing about it. That's like it's one thing to have a bad policy. It's another thing to talk about it and be giddy about the idea of locking up parents because their kids are truant. Uh, it's honestly disgusting, and it shows a lack of of understanding in how to actually address these real issues. A lot of people whose kids are truant, it's because of economic issues. It's not because you know they're bad parents. It's because they're working three jobs and they're and they're at home. So, to to she has a prosecutor's view on things. So as a prosecutor. Her way of dealing with things is, oh, let's put the fear into the eyes of these parents and put them in jail. When not every issue should be addressed through or via a prosecutor. So uh, I hope she's evolved on some of these positions, but she seemed to have been pretty protective of her past when she was questioned on it in the town hall and didn't really admit to anything. It, look, it would be awesome if these candidates came out, if, if Kamala Harris came out and was like, yeah, I said this, uh, I... I there's this video of me laughing about locking up parents. I think I look terrible in this video. Oh, it was, it was such a terrible idea. I really regret that policy. She's Here's not even doing that. That's I know, how that's what I'm she saying. Is. She should be doing that. If she was doing that, then I'd be like, okay, then look, I trust her more because she's admitting her to her mistakes. She's saying how she would actually now address these issues, but she's not doing that. She's running away from it. So it makes me trust her less. So Kamala Harris, I think, is incredibly talented, and that talent will bring her... Uh, far in the primaries, but I hope people research her, look into her, and I hope these other candidates go after her and expose her on those issues because it needs to be addressed. And but, you yeah. mentioned you mentioned Cory Booker earlier. There was something really interesting. I read this article about how the Congressional Black Caucus, the CBC, there were a bunch of people in it who, despite Kamala Harris already having announced were hesitant and refused to actually endorse anybody yet. And remember when Cory Booker was announced, the first time we found out about it was because he was trying to basically get votes from, um, trying to get support from lawmakers and endorsements. So yeah. what, how do you think that that dynamic is going to play out between Cory Booker and Kamala Harris? Because they're really going after a lot of the same people there. Uh, Cory Booker is not going to win this one. He's just... He, I. I don't know what what he what he's offering. I mean, I don't know what he has that that other candidates don't already offer. So he's, I mean, a, a lot of people have said this that he comes off as sort of fake, and that he does things for the camera. 
and there's some questions around his his past. He's talked about uh, <laughs> he made up he made up this this person T Bone. Yeah. Like the I guess he had this friend or oh he didn't have gosh. this friend. I don't know. So that's there's, so hilarious. <laughs> oh my god. I don't know the whole story, so I don't want to go too deep into that. But I'm seeing enough questions around him uh, that I don't know why he's in this race. Much like Gillibrand, I don't know who her constituency is. So I don't exactly know why they're running except to maybe boost their own profile. Do you think Jill Brand's going to get anywhere? Because what I noticed yeah. is, I mean, first of all, the Bernie supporters aren't going to support her for policy reasons. And then on Twitter, all you see is a bunch of uh, Hillary supporters dunking on her and hating on her because she had <laughs> called on Al Franken to resign. So mm. I don't see where she's going to get grab any votes. Yeah, if they're still bothered by the Al Franken thing, she... She has no constituency. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with you. I don't know who's voting for her. Uh, uh, these again, like if you're gonna vote for, uh, if you uh, are gonna support, you know, um, you want uh, a female president, you're gonna support Kamala Harris, who is more talented, is uh, is has better positions, I guess you could say, is at least a little more. There's less questions around, like Kristen Gillibrand, she has moved so much. From where she used to be on on issues that it's hard for me to trust her on anything so she used to be she was a blue dog democrat and now she's like a super progressive and su supports all the progressive issues i mean are we really gonna buy this uh, i i'm not <laughs> no so there was a video i did on uh i think it was maybe even 2017 or it was last year where i was comparing her to bernie sanders because it seemed like she was trying to actually almost almost mold herself exactly in Bernie's mold. I mean, the, she did an interview, uh, it, was, it may have been Politicon or it was some kind of uh, event like that, where she was interviewed by Anna Kasparian and Kirsten Gillibrand was taking all these progressive positions. And uh, Anna Kasparian has said after that interview, she, she discussed how uh, in her mind, in Anna's mind, Kirsten Gillibrand was being very uh, careful and very smart how she did her research, how she knew who Anna was, and she was uh, she ensured uh, Gillibrand ensured to answer the questions in very progressive ways. So, it sounds like Kirsten Gillibrand plays to her audience, and we're seeing from reports. I mean, whether it's uh, I think all the big candidates. I mean, uh, Gillibrand, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, they've all gone to Wall Street. Right. So we, we know what's happening behind the scenes here. That again, all these candidates. I think I think almost all of them have sworn off corporate PAC money, which is good, but when you look at their donations, a lot of their donations are actually large individual donors, and a lot of those large individual donations come from these cocktail parties, where they're meeting with like Wall Street executives. So this idea that it's, it, people need to understand, it's not just about corporate PAC money, it's about who are these large donors. So look, if, a, if unions are giving to you, are giving like $2,000 a plate, I don't really care because unions generally fight for labor reforms and fight for people. But if it's we're talking like if it's Wall Street or I don't know Google or whatever, we have to have we have to be a lot more question these moves more. Who these people are meeting with because it's not just about you know large sums of money. It's also about who the people are that have their ear. So it's important to keep that in mind. At what point do you think she'll drop out? You think she'll drop out before Iowa, before that even happens, the caucus there? Yeah, I don't think Gillibrand will make it to uh, Iowa. At She'll go as far as the first state, and that that's as far as she'll possibly go. But I don't think she'll go past Iowa. So I know that Joe Biden hasn't announced yet. Now, uh, I want to get your thoughts on him uh, as a candidate as well. But um, I also have a question of... He's doing really well in polling right now, which is obviously because of the, you know, uh, people reminiscing about Obama um, yeah. when really he sucks really big time. And that'll show up <laughs> in the polls once he starts running. Yeah. But should we want him to run to contribute to splitting the polls uh, between the corporatists and the progressives? Or should we not want him to run because, oh, he's the only threat to Bernie? Um, You know what? I think he could potentially take some older voters away from Bernie Sanders. So people are saying, oh, Biden will split the vote between Kamala Harris. And I, I don't necessarily think that's true. 
I think there are people out there, look, me and you know better, but there are people out there who think, oh yeah, Biden and Bernie, they they both fight for working people. But we know they don't. But Biden is able to fake it enough that he's able to get some of those voters that think, oh, Biden's a working class guy because he looks like one. When he fights for bankers, he's talking about how, uh, he supported a Republican yeah. in a race <laughs> last year. And that Republican won by I think like, you know, like a percentage. So like the, the, the idea that we have a potential 2020 Democratic candidate who supported a Republican in 2018, and this is a front runner for the Democratic primary, fuck that. No, the Biden, if he runs, his support is going to drop off immediately. Yeah. He is, once he starts talking, once he gets on stage and people are like, oh yeah, th this is Joe Biden, it's going to completely go down. But uh, in terms of splitting the vote, I think there's more of a, of a potential for him to take votes away from uneducated people that may vote for Bernie because they think Biden's a working class guy. So you'd prefer that he doesn't run instead of contributing to splitting yeah. vote. Okay. And <clears throat> do you think he will run or because I've read a report that says he's rethinking his run and kind of having to craft his message differently. Yeah. That's such a good question. I can go either way. Uh, if I were to guess now, I, I'm going to say, I don't think he will. And I don't think he will because I don't think he wants to be seen as somebody who is taking support away from Kamala Harris. So I think in his mind where he comes from, it's like, oh, Kamala Harris is definitely the front runner. So if he runs, he'll get attacked for uh, taking support away from her or, t or potentially taking support away from her. And he also, I don't think, wants to be as progressive as Kamala Harris's language is on, on these issues. I don't think... Biden wants to support Medicare for all. I don't think Biden wants to raise taxes on the rich. So I think he's afraid of maybe looking um, looking bad and potentially hurting his reputation. So if I were to guess now, I don't think he's going to run. Have you, you know about uh, Julian Castro, who's also announced? Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Is he going to yeah, make it um, anywhere? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, I forgot he was even running. Did you this see is a his guy. tweet? <clears throat> Did you see his tweet about the about college and saying that we need to try to make it more affordable the first two years? Did you see yeah, that one? Where it was just like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah it, it was. Didn't mean it was really like, what, was it the tweet where it's like, uh, uh, we should pay for the first two years of college and then something like it was. It, it was, wasn't it was, even that. It was like we should try to make it affordable. It wasn't even like, oh, let's pay for it to make it free. Yeah. So it's just these guys. These people are so clueless that. This is what's so amazing about all this. We see what's popular now. I mean, I think we're going to talk about this, but we uh, AOC's policies like taxing the rich and these sorts of progressive ideas, Medicare for all, getting money out of politics, these pull incredibly high, even with Republicans. So people are way past all the mumbo jumbo. They're way past all the establishment bullshit speak where it's like, oh, we're going to do good things and we're not going to do bad things. No, people want specifics. People want you to go after the rich. They want you to talk about how you've been screwed and how I'm going to unscrew it. So they want politicians now to not only be human, which of course is also very important, but also have a track record of actually fighting for real people. So when it gets down to it, if we actually dive into these candidates, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are going to be the only ones that have somewhat of a track record, uh, at least, well, in, in Warren's case, somewhat of a track record, in, in Bernie's case, definitely a track record of standing up for people for the past 40 years. So it's going to be, uh, hopefully we get into the actual discussions and it's not just mainstream media playing their whole rhetoric game where it's all about language and not about the details. But if we do focus on the details and who these people represent, people are going to realize if they don't already know that Bernie Sanders is the only candidate that truly represents them and has a history of fighting for them. Now, <clears throat> the question, and everyone's waiting for this, when is Bernie going to announce? Good question. Um, I think he should wait till everyone else does. I think he should be the last in. People think he should, he should like have already announced. No, let everybody else get their, you know, their 15 minutes of fame <laughs> and then let the master come in and show you how, how it's done. Like, that's that's what's got to happen. So let all these people come out. Uh, I think he should wait for Biden to even decide. Let Biden take as long as he wants to take. 
And then when Biden announced or doesn't announce, Bernie come in afterwards and really drop the bomb and just be like, look, motherfuckers, I'm here. I'm going to fight for you. I have this record. And if I were to give some advice to Bernie Sanders and his campaign, they have to run ads showing him throughout the years, like clips from the 80s, from the 90s of him fighting for people, saying the same thing over and over again, of him showing this. He's the only person in this race that has this record, that has uh, this that has shown how principled he is on these issues. So they have to use his old clips because that will show people who aren't already educated on this that Bernie Sanders is someone you can trust because he's been fighting for you the entire time. So they have to showcase that because I think they dropped the ball last time, not uh, not enough showing Bernie's history and why this is someone you should pay attention to. But this time they really have to go all out and, and really push his past out there and show that Bernie Sanders is the candidate that has been consistent on these issues. Now, there is a big question as to who should be Bernie's VP. Now, the main people mm. that I can really think of who are sort of options would be uh, someone like Tulsi, it could be Warren, um, it could be Nina Turner, or, you know, I guess a dark horse candidate could maybe be someone like Ojedo, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I have three choices and they're all going to sound familiar and, uh, or not familiar, but they're all going to have something in common. And there's an important reason for that. So Nina Turner, Stacey Abrams, or Barbara Lee. I think Bernie Sanders needs to diversify the ticket. It can't be two white men. I don't think it should even be a white woman. I think he needs a black woman on the ticket and not just in terms of identity. I mean, but the fact that there are, are these incredibly educated, talented uh, politicians that can be on the ticket, like th there's a huge selection. So why choose somebody who is just going to be another white dude? There's a lot of progressive women that can be on the ticket with you, a lot of progressive black women that can be on the ticket, might as well diversify the ticket and truly represent everyone. Because it's not just about identity, it's about what they bring through their experiences through the, uh, to the table. So Nina Turner, for example, you know, apart from being a, having the experience of a black woman, she, her, uh, her husband is a cop. I think that's incredibly important to have somebody on the ticket who, who has a family member who is in law enforcement. Because you come from the, this position of, look, not only is, uh, first of all, Nina is the number one, I mean, is my choice for VP. She was my choice back in I 2016. I agree 100%. Yeah, I, I think she's just, a, she's a, an incredible speaker. She's a, an incredible uh, communicator. She's uh, on the right side of, of all these uh, policy issues. She's, she's an amazing fighter. She deserves that, that, uh, that spot. And uh, her having that experience of running uh, our revolution, look, people are going are gonna to criticize her for not, being, or not, not having been a senator or not having been a, a congressperson. But she has, been, she has been a politician. She was a state senator, so she has experience as a politician. And for the most part, look, when you're a VP, you, uh, the job, a lot of the job is really talking to people right. and, and, and raising certain issues. And only if the president dies are you then, is that, does everything fall on you? But Nina Turner, I think, is such a, a, a strong person in general that I think it's, it's important to have um, someone on the ticket that not only diversifies the ticket, but also brings a unique experience that Bernie Sanders doesn't have. I could not agree with you more. So uh, I think we just went through all the 2020 candidates. So we'll switch over the topic here. What was it like getting blocked by Dave Rubin on Twitter? <laughs> um, I didn't know it happened until I went to. Uh... So someone in my timeline had had like quote tweeted Dave Rubin, and I didn't see the quote. I didn't see the the quote, so I clicked on it, and like you are blocked. Like what? When did this happen? <laughs> so because I never tweet Dave Rubin. I mean, I, I definitely have in the past, but it had to have been at least. I don't know, six months, eight months, a year. Um, so the block came out of nowhere. So my guess is he saw one of my videos on him. And maybe it was the one after uh, I did a video on how he supported Bolsonaro in Brazil, even though Bolsonaro is anti-gay and Dave Rubin is a married gay man. <laughs> so right. it was just, it was one of these things where like, the fraud is right in front of your faces. Like, here is Dave Rubin supporting a fucking fascist who hates who Dave Rubin is, 
has discussed, Bolsonaro has discussed how if his son was gay, he would rather his son die in a, in a car accident than stay alive. So for Dave Rubin to support Bolsonaro, this guy, Dave Rubin's being completely paid. And he, he was in a, a, a pro-Bolsonaro video. So, and this is before that. And he, this is before that, that the, the clip that I covered. And he, he still pronounced Bolsonaro's name wrong. He calls him Bolsonaro or something. So <laughs> just, I just, the, the level of, the level of fraud and the level of stupidity is truly unmatched. Dave Rubin is somebody who, this, Dave Rubin is what happens if you completely sell out. Dave Rubin has to know that he sold out. He has to know that he's a liar. He has to know that his entire career is based on a lie. So I don't know how he sleeps at night. I mean, I'm sure it's very comfortable in his $1 million home or whatever it is, but money doesn't buy you happiness. Uh, I had a job before I did this political stuff where I made more money than I currently do right now. And I was very unhappy. So right now I make much less money, but I'm much happier. I, I mean, maybe everyone isn't that way. Maybe there are a lot of people out there like Dave Rubin who only find happiness through money, but I don't understand that. So I'm not sure how he lives with himself, but um, uh, to get back to your question, though, I'm sure he blocked me because of a video I did on him, but I don't know for sure. The whole thing's funny, though. <laughs> did you see Did you see the uh, whole super chat thing that was sent to him with the majority report and he like refused to say the name? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was uh, asked about uh, debating Sam Cedar, and he's like, uh, the, 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 I don't care about those guys. <laughs> like, Have you seen the then, billboard, too? The billboard? That's yeah, there's, like a, there's a billboard. Someone's trying to uh, post a billboard about how we should debate Sam Cedar in L.A. Uh, yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> I would not want to be Dave Rubin. I don't care how much money he's making. I do. I would not want to be somebody who is living a lie. It would just be incredibly uncomfortable. And how do you come out of it? I mean... He could tomorrow be like, you guys are all right. Uh, you were all correct. I sold out. This is what I did. But I've now, I've now realized that what I did was wrong. And you know what? If he did that, he can make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe even financially, it's a good idea for him to come out and just admit everything. But uh, I somehow that would don't be pretty think he's historic if he did that. Oh, it would be incredibly historic. I mean, <laughs> this is. A, <laughs> I've said this about uh, Tommy Laren. I don't think Tommy Lahren is as conservative as she pretends she is. I just don't... I think she purposely does not educate herself. She's... I mean, you've done videos on her. She's really dumb. Yeah. So... <laughs> well, she's, she, what she's trying to do is she wants to she wants to swing with the celebrities and she wants to be a high profile. So that's why she loves beefing with Cardi B and all this type of stuff. But, is she, but does beefing with them count as swinging with them? I mean, I don't think she's... She's not in their in circle. her mind, probably. I don't know. I oh, just feel it's like so embarrassing. For her, I, I would not want. I rather Cardi B not know who I am than Cardi B tell me that she wants to uh, dog walk me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want to be on Cardi B's good side. I think Cardi B's awesome, so I want to be on these celebrities' good side if uh, if I think they're good celebrities. But um, yeah, Tommy Lahren, Dave Rubin, there, Ben Shapiro may be the only one of these people who I think actually believes his own bullshit. Um. But even then, Shapiro must know how he skews information. Uh, I don't I, think he does. I think he full on just believes everything. He doesn't have any reservations or anything like that. But he's paid to skew things a certain way. I mean, that's his. his I mean, Daily Wire is completely funded by. It's, it's Daily Wire, right? It's completely funded by by billionaires. Um, right. Yeah. It was, I, just, I think it was funded by the Wilkes brothers, right? Yeah, the Wilkes brothers. Yeah. So it just. He, he's not going to search out information that may contradict what his message is supposed to be. So I'll put it that way. So maybe he doesn't, maybe he doesn't know that he's lying to people, but he purposely is only looking at uh, certain views. I mean, anytime we talk about healthcare, f for me as a Canadian, like that is when his bullshit really shines through, <laughs> because I know he's full of shit. He talks about, oh, my wife's a doctor. I mean, if anything, that gives you uh, that gives you a skewed perspective because you have your wife making probably a shit ton of money as a doctor, <laughs> where when she might make a little less in, in a Medicare for all system. So this idea that that people don't deserve health care unless you can afford it. 
I just don't understand this at all. My entire life, I've grown up not even thinking about healthcare ever. I haven't, I haven't had to think about it because it's always been there for me. So this is one of the biggest issues or one of the biggest benefits that I think isn't talked about enough. In a system where you have universal healthcare, one of the biggest benefits is you don't ever think about healthcare. It's just there if you need it. I don't have to think about insurance companies or co-pays or deductibles or out-of-pocket expenses. I, none of this shit happens. I just, if, I sick, if I'm sick, I go to the doctor. If I, I had surgery once, I got surgery, came home, I was fine. No money, nothing. It was like one sheet of paperwork. That was it for the surgery. That's it. So uh, this, the whole system in healthcare, when Ben Shapiro or any conservative tries to argue for a private insurance-based system, it makes my blood boil. And to me, it really shows how fucking fake these people are. You did, uh, you did a video about Dave Rubin and I believe it was Ben Shapiro uh, not you know, talking about the anti-BDS law, which... Uh, we know yeah. the story about the speech pathologist who basically had the question of, oh, you have to promise to not do business with businesses that boycott Israel, which is pretty crazy. Uh, talk talk yeah. about that. Yeah, so these guys are so Dave Rubin, uh, Dave Rubin, uh, Ben Shapiro, they're so focused on on free speech issues. But when there's an actual threat to the First Amendment, like that the lady that was, I think it was Texas, she was fired as a teaching assistant because, she uh, didn't want to sign a paper saying that she she would not uh, protest or boycott against against the state of Israel. I mean, this is an actual threat to free speech. Somebody lost their job because of their view on Israel Palestine. Yet, who talked about this? Name me one of these free speech phonies, whether it's Ruben, Shapiro, uh, who else is there? The other morons, Peterson. None of these people talked about it. Actually, Peterson, no, no, someone did tweet to Peterson about it, but then it, it exposed how unaware Peterson is because Peterson said something like, oh, that doesn't seem right at all, but then he said nothing else about it <laughs> because Peterson is informed by these people that he perceives to be intelligent on political issues. So he, he gets informed from Rubin and Shapiro. So if they aren't talking about it, then to him, it's not a serious issue. Peterson, I'm sure, is very good in his area of self-help. I mean, that's his thing. But when it gets to politics, he doesn't know Dick. So for him to talk about political issues whatsoever, it exposes how stupid these fucking people are. But on the BDS thing, yeah, it's just, it, it shows you that they, they are not principled on this issue. If you actually cared about free speech, actually cared about the First Amendment, then somebody getting fired for having a, a different political view on an issue would be headline news everywhere. But it isn't. So, uh, did you did you by any chance see Jordan Peterson's debacle tweet where he he likened calling him calling people climate change deniers to Holocaust deniers? Did you see that? Uh, I think I heard, I think I saw it in passing, uh, but I don't. Sh uh, or Peterson is just I've like tuned him out at this point. He uh, I haven't covered him in maybe I don't know eight months or so. I just don't find him all that interesting because he, I don't think he's uh, I'm into politics and Peterson doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. So I get invigorated by debates that are interesting. That's why I focus a lot on on the left and and inner debates within the left because I find that stuff interesting. If you notice I don't cover Trump all that often and it's kind of a, a double reason. For one, I think Trump is covered a lot by everybody else, so I don't see a reason why I need to add my voice to that. But also, I don't find Trump interesting. He's just a very one-dimensional moron, and I have very little to say. I mean, uh, any Trump video that I would do, if I had to cover all his bullshit, it would just be like, so Trump did this today, yep, Trump is a racist, yep, Trump is a dipshit, yep, Trump doesn't know anything, okay, next. Like, I, I don't know what analysis to add. I feel like if you don't already know that Donald Trump is a dipshit, that I don't know what else I can offer you. And for me, it's the same thing with someone like Peterson. I feel like he's so he so clearly doesn't know what he's talking about that I don't know what to add to that conversation. At least somebody like Ben Shapiro, I can they have arguments and I can break down their arguments and why their arguments don't make any sense. But someone like Peterson, it's just like like climate change. How do you not how do you not understand that? 
you should be listening to people who are experts in this field. Like, I, I don't know what else to add there. Okay, so um, I wanted to uh, talk about AOC and kind of how she's basically taken, taken the country by storm, mm-hmm. um, especially with their latest top 70% marginal tax rate. And uh, just give me your thoughts on what she's done and her dunking on conservatives and stuff like that. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, AOC, I think, has changed the conversation. She has done what uh, Bernie started. So AOC, since since winning her, her seat against uh, Joe Crowley, has not compromised whatsoever. And if anything, has gone even farther. So she has discussed higher marginal tax rates on the rich, 70% on any money made over $10 million. And guess what happened? We're still talking about that. The media still talks about that. Fox News still talks about that. In a Fox News poll, the majority of people polled in a Fox News poll agreed that people making over $10 million should be taxed more. So AOC, not only is she is she uh, changing the conversation or, or, or bringing up policy issues, but she's exposing how many people already agree with these positions. So the vast majority of people in America understand that they are not millionaires, will never be millionaires, and that a lot of the people that are millionaires are millionaires because they inherited a lot of that wealth. I think I saw a, a study recently. I think it's 60% of people that, that have over, I think, $10 million, 60% inherited most of that money. So we have this system where you aren't earning the wealth. Most people are not earning the money they have. They are simply inheriting the money they have. So, I mean, look at someone like whether it's Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. These are people that were able to get loans from their parents. Elon Musk, his dad was an emerald farmer. I mean, his family was already incredibly wealthy. That's how he was able to start uh, new businesses. For, for, for Jeff Bezos, he got a loan from his parents of like $200,000. I couldn't get two hundred thousand dollars from my parents, but Jeff Bezos did, and he was able to create uh, this, uh, create Amazon, and make billions of dollars. So these people, a lot of these people that have created this amount of wealth, started from a place where they already were wealthy. Now, if you look at someone like Howard Schultz, Howard Schultz now, who's trying to run as an independent, um, but has been a Democrat all his life, he is the so the billionaire Starbucks guy. He did start from nothing, and. Now he's talking about how, oh, we shouldn't raise taxes on the wealthy. But when he started out, tax rates were much higher. In the 50s, they were at 90% under Eisenhower, a Republican president. Yet Howard Schultz doesn't want to point that out. So understand, even the people that are self-made, like Howard Schultz, and I shouldn't even say self-made. I mean, clearly people around them also helped to, to create their business. But even if you want to say someone like Howard Schultz started from the bottom, which he did, he started from the bottom in a society that was completely different than the one we are currently living in. So uh, I forget the original question now, but, but that's how we what we have to expose is how uh, how wealth is actually generated in in uh, in these Western countries, and it's not through hard work. A lot of it is through inherited wealth. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. And um, I think we'll finish it off with this last question I have for you. Um, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen with the Howard Schultz campaign? Is he going to really go through with running? You know, hecklers have been trolling him. I mean, wh- what's going to happen there? So I just shot a video on this. Uh, it'll go up maybe today or tomorrow. But um, I discussed how uh, initially I wanted Howard Schultz to to go away immediately. I'm like, this guy is offering nothing to the conversation. Why is he here? But now he's such a train wreck that I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> I want him to stay in this until the actual voting starts. Like, I don't want him to run. I, I definitely don't want him to run in 2020 because I think he could potentially take some votes away from the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, I mean, he'll essentially get the rich vote and then he'll get some dummies who, who listen to MSNBC. But largely, I, I, I don't, there's no way Howard Schultz would ever win, uh, would actually win in 2020. But what he could do is is ruin it for the Democrats. So um, in terms of what I think will happen, I, I don't think he's going to run. I think he's going to drop out rather quickly. There was a poll that came out last week. It was the most amazing poll I've ever <laughs> seen in my entire life. It's like 4% of every group support him. 
Only 4% of Democrats, only 4% of Republicans, only 4% of independents. Everybody else, his, his unfavorables were like 50, 60. Like it was, it was crazy. No one likes Howard Schultz. Everybody understands this guy is a billionaire who has no ideas. It would be one thing if he came to the table with some actual ideas, brought something to the conversation, but all he's brought is saying no. No, you can't have health care. No, don't raise my taxes. Uh, he, there is not one thing he has brought to the conversation. And then uh, the video I covered in, in, the, in my uh, segment that's going up tomorrow, he uh, discussed how uh, he was asked a question about income inequality. And he talked about how uh, we shouldn't use the word billionaires. We should use <laughs> the word uh, uh, people of means or whatever. And that shit's stupid. But also in that answer was him discussing the issue of how money influences politics, which he is absolutely correct. But then he goes on to say how I don't represent any constituency. So there's there's you know corporations funding these these candidates, but I I'm just me and I represent the people. Motherfucker, you represent the wealthy. Like he doesn't even realize his own bias. He doesn't realize where he's coming from and who and uh, the kind of policies that he supports. He supports policies that benefit the wealthy. So I hope he stays in long enough for me to continue making videos about him and, and making fun of him. But I hope he uh, drops out before any actual damage is done. I totally agree with you. I think his uh, his campaign has been a pretty big train wreck at this point. That yeah, people well, of wealth, people of means thing was really weird, too, because I didn't really understand it. I don't know. It seems like he was trying to give himself a, a new group name. Well, I think he's uh, he's bothered by the fact that billionaire has become uh, – what's the word? It, it's become – a negative like saying oh the billionaires is is automatically a slur and he doesn't like that so he's trying mm -hmm. to change it into oh don't call us billionaires we're just people of means <laughs> like okay you're whatever <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like he's trying to play identity politics but he's from the most powerful position you could absolutely have which is being a billionaire it only makes sense to to uh to understand uh identity and and how it fits in with politics if you are from a group that is lacking in 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 this society that, that has not benefited but when you are the, of the billionaire class no we do not tr need to treat the billionaires with the special names but we do not need to pay attention to the billionaires and how they feel fuck the billionaires they have everything we should pay attention to everybody else that actually needs a hand up i totally agree with you man so before we finish this off do you have anything uh, you want to end off with uh, no, just go to uh, therationalnational.com slash join, and that goes uh, that gets to my Patreon page, where uh, if you like what I do, you can support me. Um, also, of course, youtube.com slash therationalnational, and uh, follow me on Twitter at David Dole, last name spelled D-O-E-L, all one word. That's Absolutely. It. I'll make sure to leave links to that down below in the description box. Thanks a lot for doing awesome. this, David.